Okay, so if you are ever in a survival situation... Oh, that is rough. That is rough. Yikes. Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Sam Monroe and I am an ecologist. That means I study plants and animals and how they interact with their environment. I actually got my start in ecology studying sharks. I have a PhD studying sharks where I focused on things like their diet and movement patterns, and I've also written a bit about shark hunting strategies and tactics. That is why I absolutely love watching shark movies and talking about all the things in them that are accurate or inaccurate. If you've been to my channel before, you may have seen the review that I did of Jaws, and in the comment section, the most requested review that I do as a follow-up was The Meg. So that is exactly what I'm going to do now. So enough with the preamble, let's watch the movie, let's ruin it with science. All right, so this is the part of the movie where we introduce the billionaire <laughs> to his investment, which in this case is a giant marine research facility. And I have to say, as much as I love this research facility, as beautiful as it looks, and I would love to work there, uh, unfortunately, marine research facilities like this just don't exist. They are sadly not real. The only underwater research facility that's even remotely like this that I'm aware of is the Aquarius, which is an underwater research facility off the coast of Florida. But compared to the crazy ones that we see in movies, uh, it's not nearly as big or maybe as glamorous as, as these ones. Not to say that it doesn't do amazing research and isn't really impressive, it's just a lot smaller. Here we are. Follow me quickly. I hope you are on time. Come on in. It seems weird to me that like this investor our engineer and sub has, has never seen yes. this facility Hello. before. Hello. Hi. <laughs> uh, Dr. Heller, our medical officer. Nice to meet you. You're like bones, huh? <laughs> DJ here pilots our remote explorer. How's it going? Cool. Yeah, I like this. This is a really diverse team. I like it. And of course, Mark, our station chief. Mr. Morris, just in time. Cool. So I keep hearing. Lots of yeah. different people with lots of different skills. Just in time for what? This is what a real scientific right. team looks like. Laura Taylor. A mission pilot. Ah, oh, and they've got a woman driving the sub. I love this. Bonus points to the bag. If you've watched any of my videos before, you know I'm really not a big fan of sort of the classic movie trope where there's one lone genius scientist who has all of the answers and does all of the work. And in previous movies, shark movies, just sci-fi movies in general, even if there is a team, they're sort of all following one person who seems to know how to do everything. So I'm actually gonna give the Meg mad points here because this is a team that seems like when they introduced everybody, they all had really different skills. There was engineers, medical officers, there's marine biologists. So that's, that's really great that there's lots of different um, types of scientists all contributing to one project. That is really how real science works nowadays. It is multidisciplinary teams, everybody coming together to do the work. That is more, far more true to life than one person doing everything. But I'm also gonna give them bonus points of the fact that they have a good gender balance very often in sci-fi, it's a lot of a lot of men, and there's a lot of different cultures and races represented on this team as well, which is fantastic. That is what science should be. It should be all about uh, equality and lots of different people from different backgrounds all working together. So I actually really like to see that. Maybe, maybe from the bottom. Maybe. What does he mean? Maybe. That is the bottom. Come on, look at this. Since eighteen seventy-five, the Mariana's Trench is eleven thousand meters deep. The Mariana Trench was the deepest place on Earth. It's the deepest part of the I ocean, that's true. That what we think is the bottom might actually be a layer of hydrogen sulfide. Beneath that cloud and the no. freezing cold thermal climb, there could be a completely new world. The origin is about to see if my father's right. If there's warm water below, that there's means not. we're going to be the first to see it. None of this is real. Wrong. Good question. And you have wasted $1.3 billion. <laughs> investor? Right. As someone who has worked in a few different jobs where the funding for the research has come in part from private investors, yeah, that's not something you ever say <laughs> to your private investors. Uh, I don't know if you would be bold enough. He must be very confident that he's going to be right. Unfortunately for our fabulous scientific team here, they are wrong about the Marianas Trench. So let's give a little context on what the Marianas Trench actually is. It is a underwater trench that is the deepest part of the ocean. Its very deepest point, known as the Challenger Deep, is approximately 11,000 meters down, so extremely deep. 
The trench is located in the West Pacific Ocean, and it's formed where two tectonic plates, the Pacific Plate and the Mariana Plate, are actually crashing into one another. What's happening is the Pacific Plate is subducting or getting thrust underneath the Mariana Plate. And when these two plates collide and they create this subduction zone, they create this really deep trench. But here's the thing, we actually have sent submersibles down to the Marianas Trench. Some of you may even remember a really famous one where James Cameron piloted a solo mission all the way down to the Challenger Deep. So we've been down there and we know that there is no thick layer of hydrogen sulfide trapping really warm water down there for animals to live in. So this whole premise of the Mariana Trench, I guess, having sort of like a false bottom or something, <laughs> like a trap door that you can drive a submarine through, yeah, that's totally ridiculous. Okay, so we are at the bottom of the Mariana's Trench, and they're seeing a lot of life down there. That isn't quite right, that's a lot of life down at the bottom. But I do see hydrothermal vents, which is accurate. We do have those at the seafloor. Tube worms, that is accurate. Seeing a lot of species that wouldn't be there though. So what they're showing on the screen are hydrothermal vents. And you can think of these as sort of underwater hot springs or geysers. And they form a lot of the time where there are tectonic plates crashing into one another or pulling apart. And that causes volcanic activity and hydrothermal vents. Basically what's happening is there are cracks in the earth crust that are opening up and seawater is essentially funneling down through these cracks. But once it gets down there, it gets superheated and shoots back up through these vents. But when it comes back up, it's been enriched by a lot of minerals and metals that weren't in that water originally. This is actually a really important part of the deep water and ocean floor ecosystem because hydrothermal vents are really biodiversity hotspots and a lot of incredible life lives just around these vents. For plants that live at the surface of the ocean or on land, they are able to convert energy from the sun using photosynthesis to create food. And this creates the bottom of the food chain so other animals can eat those plants and we get all of the incredible life that we see on land and in the ocean surface. But if you live at the very bottom of the ocean, there is no sunlight getting down there. So there's no energy coming from the sun to help plants grow, for example. Hydrothermal vents, in a way, sort of replace the energy that creatures on the ocean floor are not getting from the sun. They release all of those minerals into the water from the Earth's crust, and there are creatures, little microbes, that live near the hydrothermal vents that convert these raw minerals and materials into energy in a process that's known as chemosynthesis. These microbes essentially form the base of a food chain around these hydrothermal vents, and all other sorts of species are able to live around them. So I'm gonna give the movie a little bit of credit because yes, hydrothermal vents are real and they are really important hotspots for life. But I'm gonna take points away from the movie because it's probably exaggerated. Um, th that's a lot of sea life down on the bottom of the Marianas Trench. That's not typically what we see when we go down there. It's far more barren, so this is a, a little bit over the top. The other issue that's a problem here is I can see a lot of fish species and other species that are deep sea creatures, but unfortunately, they aren't found that deep. If you were to go down to the Marianas Trench, species that you might see would include little shrimp-like critters, sea cucumbers, and there is a species of fish that can live down there called the snailfish, or it's a, it's a type of, of snailfish. And that is probably this fish species that we know of so far that can live the deepest in the water. So yeah, there are, or there's a fish that is down there along with a few other creatures, but nothing quite like this. Okay, so there was a giant squid attacking her ship. Really unlikely that a giant squid would have been found at these depths. Like, I mentioned this before, but like many other species, giant squid aren't at this depth. Okay, so we've got the Meg. Oh, and it ate the giant squid. I kind of like that. It's a hero moment for the Megalodon. I, I like that a lot. 
I like that very much. And I suppose it's true that it definitely would have gone after very large prey. It's a large shark, it would have needed to go after large food to get enough energy to survive. In terms of what Megalodon probably did eat, we're fairly confident that they would have eaten whales of different sizes. This is because we've actually found whale fossils with bite marks on them that we attribute to Megalodon. So that's pretty cool. We also suspect that they ate other marine mammals, marine reptiles, large fish, and other sharks as well. And now that we actually have seen the Megalodon, it's made an appearance, I can talk a little bit about the likelihood of a shark of any kind, let alone a Megalodon, living at these incredibly deep depths. In terms of modern day sharks, the deepest depths that we've ever caught living sharks today is somewhere between 3,500 and 4,000 meters. But we have never seen any sharks down at the bottom of the Marianas Trench. Now I know it is a really popular idea out there that the Megalodon is still alive today. It's just living in the deepest, darkest depths of the ocean. And that's why we haven't been able to find it. But everything that we know about the Megalodon based on the fossil record suggests that absolutely isn't the case. One of the habitats we know that it lived in were shallow seas and areas that were some Somewhat close to the coast. So it would be really strange if for the last two and a half million years, which is approximately when the species went extinct, that survivors have been spending all of their time down at the very bottom of the ocean because that just doesn't match with what we know about the habitats they likely used two and a half million years ago. Why would they all of a sudden stop using all of these different surface water habitats that they used to use? It doesn't really make any sense. So if it was alive today, we would have seen it in those habitats. And that's why we are so extraordinarily confident there are no Megalodon lurking down at the bottom of the ocean. Okay, so the shark is apparently being attracted to the lights on her submarine. Maybe. Hurry. Yeah. Okay, so we're getting a really good view of the shark now over her sub. I love it. Oh, were those claspers? Oh, that's awesome, it's a male shark. So that happened really quickly, you might have missed it, but as the shark swam over her sub, you could actually see claspers on the bottom of that shark, indicating that it is a male. Claspers are appendages that are a part of the pelvic fins on male sharks, and they are shark penises. Yes, that's right, you heard me correctly, penises. Sharks have two of them. Okay, so we're gonna get a rundown on the Meg. This should be good. This is what attacked us, a Megalodon. How big is that thing? Between 70 and 90 feet, 21 to 27 meters. No, that's too big, that's wrong. Megalodon was the largest shark that ever existed. That's true. It feared nothing. Probably. It had no predators. True. Its jaws was stronger than any other animal ever. Correct. The Meg could bite the whale in half, crashing through the bones. Maybe? The Megalodon absolutely was a top predator that would have been at the very top of the food chain. It also had a very powerful bite force, so they got that right. It does have the strongest jaws of any animal that we've ever discovered. The one thing they definitely get wrong here, though, is the size of the Megalodon. She says that the Megalodon was 21 to 27 meters, and that is way too big. Based on the fossil record, scientists have estimated that the maximum size for a Megalodon was probably somewhere around 16, 18, 20 meters. It's hard for us to get an exact estimate because we are reliant on the fossil record, but it definitely wasn't 27 meters long. That is way too big. In terms of being able to bite a whale in half? I don't know. I think it would depend on the whale. It would depend on the size of the whale and the angle that they, they bit it. Uh, I don't know. I don't know about that one. So I'm gonna say maybe it could bite a whale in half, but I think it would really depend on the size of the whale. I think this would be a really cool childhood, running around a marine research. Oh, there it is. Mm, that's such a scary scene, actually. That's so creepy. I love it. I don't know what I would do if I saw this. I would scream. I would freak out, scream, and run. She's very brave. She's just standing there. Although that is a very motionless shark. Oh! Yeah, that would be nerve-wracking. I, I would also be screaming, I think. <laughs> Couple things with that scene, though, that are worth mentioning. I actually really like that scene. I think it's really creepy. I think it's really effective. But 
The weird thing about it is that the shark was totally motionless or almost totally motionless staring through the glass and I don't really understand how that would be possible. A shark like that probably wouldn't be able to stay motionless like that because it wouldn't be able to breathe unless it, unless it kept moving. Some shark species are what are called ram ventilators and this means that they have to keep swimming with their mouths open to let the water flow past their gills. They can extract the oxygen and that's how they breathe. If they stop moving, they suffocate. So they have to keep swimming. Not all sharks have to keep swimming in order to breathe. Some sharks can pump water into their mouths and past their gills. So they can just sort of sit down on the ocean floor, for example, pumping water through their gills and breathing that way. Unlikely that the Megalodon was able to pump water Physically, we think it was very similar to a white shark, and white sharks cannot pump water. They have to keep swimming in order to get water across their gills and extract oxygen and keep breathing. So it would be weird to see a megalodon completely motionless like this, not moving forward, because it wouldn't be able to breathe. You said it was impossible for it to get up here. I should have. did say that. You guys, take a look at this. When the glider came up, the thermocline was intact, so it was one degree Celsius, okay. right? Yeah. But a minute later, when the evolution came up, the temperature increased by 25 degrees. A shark had come right through there. What? 20 sharks, for that matter. When the meg hit the origin, it slammed what? into a thermal vent. Okay. Those can release millions of gallons per minute. All right. The heat from that vent cleared the path through the freezing cold layer. Are you saying we opened up a super highway for giant sharks? <laughs> <laughs> I really like the billionaire. He's got the best line. I like how the movie tries to like give a legitimate science explanation and then the billionaire character just comes in with his quips and his one-liners to explain it to you. First of all, what they were talking about there was a thermocline, which is a layer in the ocean where the temperature of the water changes dramatically. And what usually happens is, although not in this movie, uh, when you go deeper into the ocean, the ocean becomes rapidly cooler. It, it, the temperature changes really fast and it goes from fairly pleasant to freezing cold. It is true that sharks are limited in terms of where they can live and where they can swim based on the temperature of the water because different species have adapted over time to survive in different conditions. Based on the fossil record for the megalodon, we suspect that this species lived in tropical and temperate waters, which means it didn't live in the polar water. So it didn't live in really, really, really cold water in the Arctic or in the Antarctic. So yeah, it's possible it may have avoided freezing cold water Hard to say. But the whole rest of this scenario is totally ridiculous. The idea that the sub and hydrothermal vents and I don't know, all this fuel exploded to create a giant water column of hot water. The size of that column would need to be huge. Remember, this is like 11,000 meters deep. <laughs> so the size of that water column would have to be pretty tall in order to give the sharks an escape route to the surface. So this whole thing is totally ridiculous, but it is true that sharks are limited or will at the very least select their habitats in part based on the temperature of the water. Okay. So the strategy that they have come up with is to send poor Jason into the water to try and attach a tracking device to the Meg in order to keep tabs on it. Okay, and he's attached the tracking device to the dorsal fin, which is typically what we try and do when we are attaching tracking devices to these animals. Okay, so now they're pulling him in. I would also like to get the stop. No vibration. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, Jonas is coming at you. Maybe. So it's certainly true that vibrations in the water, sharks can definitely detect those. In fact, they don't really need to be able to see prey to know where it is. They can detect the movement of species in the water, they can detect vibrations, they can hone in on those vibrations and head towards prey. So I think what's happening here is the vibrations of the boat or you know, winching in that cable is alerting the megalodon to their presence. What I question, and I don't know this for sure, but I question whether or not the megalodon would even care that Jason was in the water. Because it is such a big predator, it would be going after much bigger prey than the size of a person, probably. So I don't know how interested it would be in chasing down a person for a meal. So now the plan seems to be they're gonna try and kill the shark with a poison dart through the skin. She's gonna get in her cage and do that. I don't know if I'd wanna be in a cage <laughs> with, with the megalodon. So you 
you know, tastes good. Okay, so they're chumming the water, which definitely is something that shark scientists Thank and you. fishers bye -bye. do bye -bye. all the time. <laughs> Putting chum in the water, which is essentially fish blood and guts, attracts the sharks because they can smell all of that. And to them, it might indicate that there's an injured animal in the water and they might want to go eat that. Oh, there it is. Yeah. So that's actually probably a predatory tactic, a hunting tactic that a megalodon would have used, similar to some modern day sharks. Uh, approaching from underneath your prey, a surprise attack with a lot of force would have potentially crippled your prey, knocked them out, stunned them. If you get a good bite, you can take them out really quickly. I actually hey, like the design of the Megalodon. Yeah, Although that bit. seems like way too many gill slits. Look. Can we go back and count those real yeah. quick? One, two, hey, three, four, five, six, seven, yeah, eight. Oh my goodness, that's too many. <laughs> So most sharks have five gill slits. There are some species that have six or seven. I've never heard of a shark that's had eight gill slits before. So that's too many gill slits. It's funny because I was just thinking, like I actually quite like the overall design of this Meg. The animal we most commonly compare it to is a white shark. So that is the modern day living species we think it looked most similar to. But it probably wouldn't have looked exactly like that. So they do get a little bit of leeway, I think, to be a bit creative with what it looked like. And for the most part, I thought they did a pretty good job, but the gill slits thing is, is not accurate. Get out of the water. <laughs> get out of the water! There it is. Oh, wow, what a breach. Yep, taking down the other shark. That boat is toast. <laughs> There's no way it could handle the weight of that thing. I do wonder whether the boat could actually handle the first megalodon that it had reeled in and was hanging up. I think just the weight of that smaller megalodon probably would have sunk it. Just all that weight concentrated at the back of the boat. And it would have been a really heavy shark, so I don't know if they would have been able to reel it in. But in regards to the shark that just jumped out of the water, that is what we call a breaching behavior. And you're probably familiar with that if you've watched Shark Week and seen white sharks breach out of the water. It's a really incredible sight. White sharks are capable of leaping their entire bodies out of the water, completely exiting the water and flying through the air. And this is a hunting tactic that they use because it helps them sneak up on prey and hit them with an incredible amount of force. The question is whether or not a megalodon is capable or was capable of the same type of breaching behavior. Based on some of the reading that I did in preparation for this movie, uh, there seemed to be some debate over whether or not a megalodon would be capable of the same type of breaching behavior that we see in white sharks. I think generally speaking, megalodon scientists agree that they would have been able to breach to some degree, I mean, whales can breach as well. So the question isn't, could they breach? I think generally most people think that they could breach. The question is, were they able to fully leap out of the water the way we see modern day white sharks do? And I think that's something that is still debated. And I have seen some scientists argue they, they don't think that they would be capable of that, but I'm not sure. I think that's still an issue that we're still talking about and trying to figure out. Oh, are you seeing this? Ooh. Okay, so in an attempt to kill the megalodon, they seem to have killed an innocent whale. And what you're seeing now is a bunch of nearby sharks are scavenging the whale carcass for food. And this is an accurate representation of shark behavior. So we don't really know how often sharks will find whale carcasses and scavenge them for food because of course a lot of this happens when we don't see it out in the ocean. But we do know from when whale carcasses have been close to shore that sharks will smell these carcasses because they've got excellent senses of smell and they will track down the carcasses and they will scavenge them for food. From the shark's perspective, this is a great source of a free meal. They haven't had to do anything to get it. They haven't had to waste energy trying to kill the animal or chase it down. If a shark is lucky enough to find a whale carcass, they can get a lot of food from that carcass and potentially not have to eat again for a really long time. So if they find one of these, it's, it's great for them. It's a really good food opportunity for these sharks. Okay, so we're nearing the end of the movie now. It's time to deal with this Meg. We've got nothing left. Almost nothing. How are you gonna kill it? How indeed? Evolution. Evolution. I'm gonna make this thing bleed. <laughs> See, and when you said before you That's a great line, but I don't really understand how that's you. evolution. <laughs> is it it's evolution that is bleed? Sign it off. Why are you taking off your communication device? How is that helping anybody? <laughs> Okay, what's happening? 
Oh, okay, so it's gonna cut open the shark, and it's cutting yeah, open right the ventral there. side. So, yeah, I mean, that could work. That could potentially work, sure. So sharks have very thick skin, female sharks in particular, and I didn't see any claspers on this shark, so I think this megalodon is a female. The reason females have very thick skin compared to male sharks is because of their mating rituals. Male sharks will actually bite onto the females in order to get a grip on them and stay close to them. Remember that they are mating in zero gravity environments, essentially, so that's very hard to do. So one of the strategies they use to help with that is by biting onto the females and wrapping around her so they can stay nice and close. So while sharks do have pretty thick skin and really tough skin, yeah, yeah, I mean, I mean, like, it's not, it's not indestructible. It's, it's not freaking mithril. Like, you could cut through it. You would just need a good enough knife to do it with. And I guess the submarine has a big enough, strong enough knife. Yeah. Okay. So he seems to be stabbing its face. Maybe going for the gills. Oh. Oh. Well, that's gross. Uh, going for the eyes. Yeah. Okay. So if you are ever in a survival situation, oh, that is rough. That is rough. Yikes. Okay, as I was saying, if you are ever in a survival situation where you need to get away from a shark quickly, aiming for the gills or eyes or the front of its face in general, these are places we recommend you you try and hurt it. You try and punch it, kick it, or whatever you can do. These are areas that the shark will want to protect itself. Um, these are very vulnerable parts of the shark, so this is where you want to aim because the idea is that you will scare the shark or injure it enough in these places, it will release and swim away. So the strategy here of aiming for these parts of the shark is not a bad idea. Okay, so it's really bleeding out now. I'm surprised it took so long to die from those injuries. Oh, is it still alive after getting, oh no, it's getting eaten. Oh, it's getting eaten. Okay, so this is a little bit like what I described earlier. Sharks will scavenge the carcasses of dead animals. <laughs> Although I have to say, that's a lot of sharks. Oh my goodness, that is, I'm just seeing them now. That is a lot of sharks to be in that area and show up all at once. And now what's happening? Oh, no, that would, no. Okay, that's not right at all. A hammerhead would not attack a person like that. Honestly, a hammerhead shark is kind of a weird choice for this movie, for that to be like the shark that's coming at him at the end because hammerhead sharks are notoriously shy. When they see people, and I know this from experience, you know, when, you're, when you go scuba diving, for example, and, and there happens to be a hammerhead shark around, the minute they see a person in the water, they usually leave, because they really don't like being around people, and they get very scared of them. So the idea that a hammerhead shark would go after Jason here is a, is a, bit, a bit weird. That's a bit of a weird choice. <laughs> All right, everybody, that was my scientific review of the Meg. I hope you enjoyed watching it, and thank you so much for supporting my channel and watching this video. If you enjoyed this video, please do like and subscribe. It really helps me out. And if you're keen for more, you can go ahead and watch this other video I did where I reviewed the movie Jaws. I hope you enjoy it, and I'll see you next time.